I want to tell you about a new podcast called Amuse News. Publishing multiple days a week, Amuse News is your source for food news, interviews from around the food world, and more. On the show, we'll be engaging with food storytellers, from chefs to advocates to people working in the field, and many more. Find Amuse News wherever you get your podcasts. Amuse News is a destination for everyone who's looking for a new, insightful look into the world of food. Hey, it's Eli, and I want to tell you about Magic Mind, a little magic elixir that makes you focus better on your work, be more creative, and drink less coffee. I've got a special offer for you, the listeners of Heritage Radio Network. All you have to do is go to www.magicmind.co forward slash HRN, and you can use the discount code HRN at checkout to get 20% off your first order. This is Eli Sussman, and welcome to a brand new episode of The Line on Heritage Radio Network. On today's episode, Ben Van Leeuwen, co-founder and CEO of Van Leeuwen Ice Cream, where he leads product development and commercialization. The idea for Van Leeuwen began with a truck. As a teenager, a job driving a good humor truck led Ben and his older brother Pete to start on the path that led to the Van Leeuwen Ice Cream Empire. That summer in Connecticut many years ago, before his senior year of high school, Ben and Pete sold frozen treats to locals. Ben then used his earnings from that summer selling ice cream to travel around Europe and Southeast Asia for a year before college. Tasting new foods and exploring ingredients while traveling from country to country, Ben came home inspired and set out to create an ice cream brand using only the highest quality ingredients. The goal was to reimagine the ice cream truck for the discerning customer. Van Leeuwen has come a long way since the first yellow truck hit the streets of New York in 2008. The company has grown from ice cream trucks into brick and mortar locations that now exist in New York, Texas, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Colorado and Connecticut on the way. They have national shipping and product placement at thousands of grocery stores. They recently closed an additional round of fundraising, which allows the company to expand even more over the coming years. On this episode, Ben joined me to discuss the developments and production of their novelty ice cream bar line, and we go deep on stabilization bases, supply chain issues, rising costs of goods, as well as wholesale versus scoop shops, where you'll find out which one is better for the business. And for those looking to start their own food businesses, or even those who are further along in the process of working on a fundraising round, you'll hear great advice on building a brand and what securing financing can help founders achieve. Now... On to the episode. Uh, ben, thanks for joining me. I'm glad to be speaking to you today. And you are in Utah, right? I am in Utah right now, yep. So Van Leeuwen's uh, based out of Greenpoint, New York, and the vast majority of lo your locations are in New York. What are you doing in Utah? I am in Utah right now visiting a co-manufacturer we use to make the chocolate dipped ice cream bars that we put on the market about about a year ago exactly actually almost exactly a year ago and so that's a new skew for you you've got products that are in pints you've got scoop shops what's the motivation to get into uh, a different product line was it uh, competition from from other outside forces? Did you get bored and wanted to do something new? Sure, like why yeah. do a, a dipped ice cream bar? I, I'm going to give you three answers. So I'll start with the PR answer, which is in part true. I got into the ice cream business about actually exactly 20 years ago, almost to the, to the month, like two months ahead, driving good humor ice cream trucks where I grew up in Connecticut. So I was selling ice cream bars off of a truck. Um, we we started Van Leeuwen and never had the capability to make a product like that, nor was that our vision from day one. But a few years in, we started thinking about it. We thought, how cool would it be if we sort of brought it back to those bars, but super premiumized ice cream bars, which, or I should say ultra premiumized, because haagen -Dazs does a good job of the bars too, but they're not the sort of super high butter fat, super high egg yolk that, that we do at Van Leeuwen. Um, and at that time, this was 10 years ago, we didn't have the scale to produce them because very differently than producing a three-gallon tub of ice cream or even ice cream pints, 
there aren't small factories that do those and you can't build a small factory to make those. Um, for example, if we were to build a small scale production for ice cream bars, we'd be looking at like five to $10 million in CapEx um, on top of the rent and finding the space. So it's a big project. Um, so the idea didn't work then, but we kept thinking about it. Um, and three years ago, we brought on a VP of sales and she said, guys, the novelty market novelties are ice cream sandwiches, chocolate dipped ice cream bars, things like that, um, is blowing up and we should get into it because we can increase our revenue. And so we're looking at the data, we're saying this works, and then and then we're taking the intuition and saying this also feels good. This is something we've already want, always wanted to do and they're really yummy. And we started producing them. Um, it was not nearly as easy as that sounds. Um, there's a huge demand for novelty production right now. Everybody wants to make them um, because the markets, my, my, my numbers are going to be slightly off, but I think the super premium ice cream market's probably growing like 10 to 20% a year, which is a lot. Um, the novelty market's growing over 100% a year. And when you say novelty, what type of products is that? So a novelty is an ice cream bar. It's an ice cream sandwich. Um, what else would it be? It would be a prepackaged ice cream cone, like the King Cone, the Choco Taco. Um, so it's almost like the snack food of ice creams. It's something you can open your freezer, grab, not have to get an ice cream scoop, a bowl, a spoon, not have to do any dishes and just quickly eat. So I, and there's no data to back this up. I think that's why they're doing so well. Um, for, for better or worse, like the consumers are demanding convenience. Um, and I think also because of the convenience, you eat more of them. Um, I, right after our first production of the bars, both my brother, Peter and I caught COVID in Utah. So we were quarantined at his house in California with like 200 sample bars that we brought back. <laughs> And I was just like sitting there with COVID, like eating three or four bars a day. It was so easy. You just grab it, you open it, you throw the stuff in the trash. Um, so that market's exploding. But um, did I answer everything there? I feel like I missed. Yeah, some. yeah. And do you feel, is there any part of you that believes that the smaller quantity, perhaps people that feel like having pints around is sort of like a dangerous prospect for them of like eating the whole pint in one sitting and a bar is a smaller amount, even though technically you could eat six bars out of the box in one sitting right. as well. It's like, is it a psychological thing? I think it is because it's easier to portion control, right? Um, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't stop me at all. If I want bars, I'm going to have like, if I, if I'm like really into it, I'll eat two or three in the same way that if I'm really into a pint, I will finish it. Um, which is terrible. It's really bad for you to eat that much sweets. But yeah, that seems like something that would be difficult to balance because your your whole life is, you know, your ice cream product, and it is just the actual contents of it are what it's sugar, it's egg, but it's butter, right? So it's it's more, it, it's, it's butter fat from the cream. It's butter fat, <laughs> and, and, right? And you're getting some butter fat from the milk. You're getting lactose sugars from the milk, um, and then you're getting whey protein from the milk. Um, and then the eggs are sort of helping us emulsify because we're cooking it. And sugar we need for the um, <clears throat> flavor enhancement. And then also sugar is really really important for the scoopability and. In, um, it sort of inhibits the ice crystallization. So sugar's antifreeze. So the sucrose coats all the water molecules and gives you a good mouthfeel. And that's what allows it to have the creaminess and not the kind of freezer burn, like ice shard particles on it that sometimes exactly. you see when you have ice cream. Yeah. So with, with ice cream, when we're formulating, our really big metrics are solids, fat, and sugar. So we look at total solids as a percentage and total solids will range. If you, you can actually easily calculate it from looking at the nutritionals, but they'll range from like 20% for like a really, really economy priced ice cream to like 46%, which is what Van Leeuwen is. And I don't think anyone's higher actually that I've seen. Um, but the solids are going to give you 
that unctuousness, that chew. Um, but you can you you can get that without the solids if you use a lot of stabilizers. So like if you went to McDonald's and had a McFlurry, you you'll take a bite and you're like, oh my gosh, that's so rich. But it'll very quickly, for me at least, it like dissipates at the back of the palate. And you're like, wait, it is rich, but it's not rich at all. And that's the I mean, that's the extraordinary thing about like a really um advanced engineered um stabilization um base in your ice cream which might be guar gum carrageenan carob which is the only one we use which is like a really really good one but then there's also less natural ones and they do incredible stuff because like at the front of the palate they will make something taste creamy if it's like almost no fat and why do you want to do that because fat's really expensive right um interestingly sort of an aside but from like many other food producers were battling the both supply chain and just inflation right now so we use a lot of cream our ice cream's 18 percent butter fat from december to january our cream price went from a dollar five to a dollar 66 a pound as of two days ago it was 201 a pound so that's insane in our, yeah in, in in the scoop shops can absorb it because the margins are really good there. Um, but on the wholesale channel, it's really tough. I definitely want to talk about supply chain, and I think we'll get to that next. But before we get there, yeah. I want to jump back just a little bit to kind of discuss some of the science aspect of it and also just sort of the R&D, right? So um, I own a restaurant, and we developed recipes, and then we tweak them over time, and then – we cook the food and then we sell it to customers. Um, is that the similar process that you went through when you started your trucks? And then at what point did the process, if it did, become much more scientific where you had to maybe bring in people to help scale that up? What I'm wondering is, is like once you open multiple stores and you go D to C direct to consumer at, at the either online or, you know, in a grocery store, I'm wondering, does the science and technology change dramatically from just you basically tinkering around and building a flavor? Yeah, um, <clears throat> great question. For the type of ice cream we make, it doesn't change at all. And the reason for that is ice cream's serving state is also a preserved state, frozen. Um, and it's and its sort of shipping state is a super perverse, preserved state because you need to keep it even colder when you're storing and shipping it. Um, so that sort of gives you a lot of freedom to not have to think about shelf stability um, so you don't have to ever add preservatives to ice cream. It's interesting. I'll sometimes see ice creams marketed as like, no preservatives. And I'm like, no ice cream needs preservatives. It's frozen. It's not shelf stable. Um <clears throat> So when is, but, but we were especially, I mean, lucky in some ways, stupid in others. We've always done our own production. Um, many, many, many other ice cream brands, and I'm not saying it's better or worse, have never made their own ice cream. They find a co-manufacturer and do it. Um, if you're using a co-manufacturer, you basically need to do what they say, right? Depending on how important a customer you are to them. But if you're really small and you're starting out, you're not going to have much leverage. So if they say, Ben, the butter fat's too high, we think this is too thick, and 8% egg yolks is too much, we can't make it if you don't change it, we would have probably had to bring those things down like 12 or 15 years ago when we were starting. But because we were making it ourselves, we had the freedom to do really unusual things. Um and then we got big enough where when we were going to a co-manufacturer, ex except for the novelties, that, that's hard, but for all the other stuff, when we were going to a co-manufacturer, the business was enough where we could say, we have some unusual processes and we need you to do it this way, do it that way. So, so I guess to answer the question, <clears throat> we did not ever have to bring in, com we call it, and I only just learned this word, but com or not this word, but how it applies this we did not have to bring in commercialization experts to 
be able to scale up our product. Um, the high fat levels, high eggs made it super shelf stable. Um, and we were able to produce it at scale out of our own plant and at other plants. Now, with the vegan product, it's actually, it's much more difficult. So when we started making vegan ice cream about 12 years ago, the goal was to make it not a good vegan ice cream, but a really good ice cream that just happened to be vegan. So we said, how do we do that? We need a lot of fat. We need a lot of solids. Um, we need really luscious fat. So we liked cocoa butter. We liked coconut oil, but it's all, you know, cooks and chefs know like, those two fats have really, really high melting points. So that means if you make an ice cream base, like what would be a creme anglaise with dairy or custard, um, with cocoa butter and coconut oil at like 22% of the mix, when you cool that down and hold it, it's going to turn into pudding or even be completely solid. So if you think about putting that into like a big manufacturing plant, you're like, wait, the Department of Agriculture FDA requires you to cool it below 40 degrees. We have to get it out of the danger zone, which solidifies it. So you're like, okay, how do we do it then? So we have four hours to keep it at 80 degrees before we freeze it. Um, and if your ice cream freezer, any equipment breaks, you have this vegan mix sitting there and you're like, wait, what do we do with that? Because it could be sitting in like a 2000 gallon vat and if that turns to pudding, it's like, I mean, it would be an absolute nightmare. So <clears throat> scaling that up has been extraordinarily difficult. Um, manufa like Big manufacturers don't want to touch it. And we always say, guys, we've been doing it in Brooklyn for you know 15 years. Like It works. Um, why won't you do it? So that's, so that's been really tough um, because we, we really do think the vegan ice cream we make is, is one of the best on the market. So... We don't want to bring the fat down. We don't want to change the fats, um, which is why we're still making it ourselves. And so that process of, of cooling it, if you can go into a little bit more detail, are you passing that through pipes that are encased in water and you're cooling it as you move it? Or are you like, how is it being cooled? I don't know. Exactly. What an awesome question. Nobody ever asks that. So the process of making both the vegan and dairy ice cream is – we start with something called the bretto, which is basically a, a roboku, but it's like a uh, like two hundred gallon roboku, and we put all of our ingredients there in stages and blend them. From there, we pipe we pump them into a pasteurization tank, and the pipe that pumps has pressurized air that pushes all of the ingredients in, so the formula is perfect, right? Because you can't have every anything left in the pipe before everything's mixed together. We then pasteurize to the FDA standards of like, I think it's like 160 for 30 minutes. We go to 180 because we like that really sort of custardy taste that you get from cooking the eggs a bit more. Um, then we pass it through what's called a homogenizer. So the homogenizer is, I think it, it, it's basically screens with teeny, teeny holes and you're pushing the mix through that at high pressure to basically break down the, the particles and make it more homogenous. So unhomogenized milk is the milk where the fat goes to the top. Homogenized milk is milk that stays homogenized. Um, small scale ice cream makers never use homogenizers. We used to not use a homogenizer. You can still make a really good product, but and I'm getting the heat thing too in a sec. But what, what I love about the homogenization is it's a mechanical way of making the product more shelf stable. So it makes it creamier and richer just through a mechanical process, which to me is awesome because we like keeping the label really clean and keeping unnecessary ingredients out. But when we went from not homogenized product to this larger scale plant that we built in Brooklyn with homogenized, I, it was like one of the most exciting moments ever because I was like, wow, this is a rare example of a product that when you scale up, it can actually get better. Because I think we're the the perception is like the more you make, the worse it's gonna get, which I think with a lot of products is true. Um, but with this, if you're using the same inputs, the same great ingredients, it can stay just as good. So after homogenization is when we have to cool it down. <clears throat> and we put it through what's called a plate heat exchanger. So it's like 
200 really thin plates and the in on one side of the plate cold water is passing through so it's cooling down the other side of the plate and then the ice cream mix passes over that plate that's getting cold and it's a continuous process so you are using gosh i think something like 30 gallons per minute <clears throat> so it's a of water to cool it down um, so it's a really intensive process. So that's where we cool it down. Um, and then we put it into a vat and we then pump it into what's called a continuous freezer. Um, so a continuous freezer is a barrel that gets really cold and has blades, a dasher, that, and you push the ice cream through starting at one end. And by the time it makes it to the other end, it's gone from a liquid mix to soft serve consistency, and it's either packaged right away, or if we're doing a flavor with inclusions like cookies and cream or chocolate fudge brownie, we'll send it through what's called a fruit feeder, which is a machine that drops in cookies or chunks of fruit. And then we'll, right before we package it, if it has a swirl, we'll swirl that swirl of wild blueberry jam or lemon curd or chocolate fudge into the product. Um, and the more stuff you add, the more waste you're going to have in production because even like the biggest plants I've been to, like brownies, for example, they always like jam up the lines like at least once throughout a production. And when the line gets jammed and you have to shut down, everything in the lines melt, right? So depending on how big your plant is, you might have like 40 gallons in the line or you might have like 200 gallons in the line. So if the shutdown is like, I mean, 200 would be a lot, say like 40 to 80. So the shutdown, if it's like 10 minutes or 20 minutes, most of what's in the line is melted and can't be packaged. So our goal when manufacturing, whether it's like in Brooklyn or at this co-manufacturer in Utah, is avoiding production stoppages, right? Because they're just, they, they're so expensive. And aside from the financial impact, seeing it just like completely guts me. Like seeing the prod, like seeing 40 gallons of ice cream. Um, in, in Brooklyn, we have to throw it away. Here, everything is kept and sent to pig farmers. So at least it's not wasted. Still to see, to be, you know, still a pretty small operation and see waste going down the drain, you're thinking my productivity has gone down. That's some margin yeah. that has gone literally down the drain. And right. that is a tough thing to swallow when you're counting on everything to go perfectly right. Right. Uh, well, because Eli, we see like how hard it is to make a dollar. Right. We're like, oh my God, it's so much easier to save one. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and what's what i what i found what i find increasingly interesting as i talk to people that are making things that are food products that are not coming out of a restaurant right so i'm talking about beer uh any type of like product that's a prepackaged product at a certain point to me, it seems like it's less about the food. And I mean that with no disrespect, but it becomes this massive uh, production process that has all these layered elements on top of it that you have to become an expert in. So by that, I mean like all you have to do in a restaurant is just get product in and, and then you usually just heat it and then you put it on a plate, right? But you're talking about homogenization, pasteurization. There's a ton of temperature control you are doing all these things at a large scale production level. At one point you had an ice cream truck and now you have over, you know, like two dozen locations and you're shipping to like almost every state in the United States. Right. So um, at what point did you start scaling up and who did you reach out to and who did you speak to in order to, figure out how to build out the factory? Did you bring in a, a consultant who had worked on ice cream? Did you just start tinkering yourself and buying machines and you got a, a small one and then a medium one? I guess I'm wondering, like, how did you learn how to do all of yeah. this? Because you're saying ice cream is not that complex of a process. But what we're actually talking about is you are a 
you are a production company, a shipping company, and you also have to have a huge sort of quality control apparatus as well. So um, what are the steps to building out that factory and then keeping things consistent as you scale? Sure. So I'll tell you the way we did it, if that if you have time, and then I'll tell you the way I would do it with based on what I know now. For the first two years, we co- we only co-manufactured. We started the business with fifty thousand bucks, so it was enough to buy a used post office truck and turn it into an ice cream truck. Not nearly enough to even buy a thirty thousand dollar batch freezer. So we co-manufactured in upstate New York, but it never felt right. Um, we wanted to do, we wanted to pivot and be nimble and make new flavors and go to the farmers market and find awesome stuff and. You know that 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 was us. We're I mean we're, we're we're really into food and cooking and ingredients excite us and that's what we wanted to do. So it felt very inauthentic to only be co-manufacturing. Um, so we were still very small at this time. So this was two years in. So this would have been two thousand nine. Um, we started looking for a factory. So what that entailed was me riding my bike around Greenpoint looking for for rent signs. Um, for some reason, I wasn't sophisticated enough to think that like I should get a real estate broker to help with that. And I saw a shuttered Polish restaurant on Driggs Avenue in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. And I said, that place looks good um, <laughs> because it had a sink um, and it had a hood and we were doing some pastries as well. So I thought, oh my gosh, we're going to save, you know, a hundred grand on this. So we signed a lease. I think it was $3,000 a month, which was very exciting. 2,000 square foot space. Um, It was a terrible space to be making ice cream. You know, it was too small. The storage was in the basement. Um, And for about $40,000, we turned it into an ice cream factory. I went on eBay. I found a batch freezer and a little Carpeggiani european style sort of small batch pasteurizer and a blast freezer and i bought all three of those things i think for twenty thousand dollars um used and they worked great um i also bought used a used walk-in freezer and cooler which you know never ever ever buy used refrigeration stuff unless you have like the best tech ever um but just it's it's not worth it um so so we we had we did what we could with the money we had there was no consulting with experts. Um, I, I, I'm very curious about food and particularly about my own industry, ice cream. So I did a lot of research um, and I looked at, you know, I, I knew these used machines we were buying were really high qual- a high quality brand um, that could be serviced. So, I mean, this is really detailed, but whenever you're buying equipment, you need to get something that a lot of people use in your region because you need to get something where they have service technicians around. Um, if you Great don't, advice. particularly yeah. with like w- with complex manufacturing equipment, it will break a lot. Um, so ideally you need an awesome tech in house, but when something major goes wrong, you need to know that there's like parts readily available in the U S ideally, or a really good parts department in Europe where a lot of this stuff is made where they can like DHL you something overnight. Otherwise you'll be shut down. This is if you're doing your own manufacturing. So we built this little plant in an old Polish restaurant in Greenpoint. And we got up to, I think we got up to like $7 million a year out of that. We were just the, because we, this is another story, but we also decided to turn it into an Indonesian restaurant <laughs> So it's an Indonesian restaurant slash ice cream factory. And we got up to like 7 million bucks a year on the ice cream business out of 600 square feet of production space. So you might say that's awesome. Like it, it didn't feel awesome. It sucked. It was incredibly stressful. You know, we knew that this isn't the way you should be doing it. Um, so we went to banks and we said, we want to build a new factory. Can you loan us some money? We think it's going to be a quarter million dollars, which is like net now a joke. You know, we couldn't do anything with that in terms of building a plant. And, you know, every bank said, absolutely not. We're not loaning you money. You know, if you if you give us $250,000 and we put it in a locked account, we'll happily loan you money. And I was like, huh? Like, what's the point of that? 
and, and, I, and I met someone and she said, just, you know, she was an um, investment banker. And I was like, what do you think I should do? Should I sell a piece of the company to get this money? And she said, no, you, you can get a loan. I was like, but we can't. And she was like, just try harder. So I kept trying. I found a SBA program and we got a, we actually got a $600,000 loan, which was incredibly exciting for us. And we found a 5,000 square foot um, old marble manufacturing or fabricating warehouse in Greenpoint. And we turned it into a little ice cream factory. But nowhere throughout this process um, were, we, were we using a manufacturing expert to lay out the whole thing. So we did do it by room, though. So I said, for my pasteurization room, I need an expert. Um, so I hired someone who sold me the equipment and also laid out the room. And he could tell us things like, you're going to need a lot of stainless steel piping, and it needs to be sanitary welded. I had no idea what that meant, but that means you need to weld it in a way where there's absolutely no seams or divots at all. Um, sanitary welders are like, $275 an hour. So all of these little costs drove the project up. Um, but we ended up with something that was incredibly exciting for us because we went from being able to pasteurize, I think, 15 gallons an hour to like 200 gallons an hour. Um, so that was just absolutely amazing. Um, but again, we raised $600,000 and we also needed to open more stores so we could sort of support this bigger factory. So $600,000 wasn't even close to enough to build a sophisticated, um, sort of up-to-date manufacturing facility. It was super bare bones. Um, so we, did, we have done this sort of piece by piece over the, uh, over the last six years on this bigger facility in Greenpoint. Um, and I would never recommend that. I would recommend trying to do it right from the get-go, um, you know, but we, we just didn't have the money to do that. So two years ago, right around this time, um, we did another renovation on the factory in Greenpoint. We had closed what's called the Series B round of financing. It was the second round of institutional financing we did. And it was, I think we got 11 million bucks, ton of money. We had a little bit of... Um, accounts payable that we needed to take care of right when that closed. So I think we ended up and, and we paid off some debt. So we ended up with eight or nine in the bank. Um, and we did a $4 million renovation to the existing plant in Greenpoint. But we couldn't risk the renovation taking more than like eight to 10 weeks. And because of that, we couldn't change the layout. Um, because we had all of these products, most of which couldn't be sent to a co-manufacturer and all of these orders that we had to fulfill with wholesalers and for our own scoop shops, or so we thought the scoop shops wouldn't end up mattering because of the pandemic. Um, so we kind of kept the layout of this factory um, in terms of some plumbing and electrical, brought in a ton of new equipment, redid the floors. Um, but this part of it, I had so little time that I could not um, engage whoever are the best consultants for building ice cream factories in the country. And when I, you know, here in Utah, we're in a 200,000 square foot factory that cost about $80 million to build. Um, and I'm unbelievably envious of just the finishes and the, the spacing. Um, so my, my dream would of course to have been, um, you know, six years ago when we moved to the bigger factory in Greenpoint, to have had 10 million bucks and been able to build something amazing. But there's no way we could have gotten that. I mean, there's no way. So we kind of did what we could with, with what we had. When you say that the Series B, which was institutional, are you talking about banks, venture capital? Did you take private investment? And did you, you have two major partners in the company still, correct? So yes, did, Pete and Laura. So did all three of you have to give up a portion of the company or did it not work that way? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, so the way, so our, our series B was when I say institutional financing um, on that, it was equity financing. So we sold a piece of the company to a private equity firm called next world based in San Francisco. Um, 
And th the way it works is you take the money and you issue more stocks. So let's say we had 100 stocks and we, and Pete and Laura and I each owned 30. Um, and to raise this money, we issued 30 more. Then there's 130 stocks and we still each have 30, but we have 30 divided by 130 versus 30 divided by 100. So we call that dilution. So the more, the more, equity you sell, um, the more diluted you are. So the, the, and this is a really, really important one. If you're growing a business in a way where you do need to sell some of it, um, it would be amazing if you didn't, but I, we, when, when we're thinking about raising money, the question is like, okay, is this money going to, it, in the medium term or even long term, increase the value of the business more than the amount of equity I'm using? Meaning let's say you lose 50, let's say you're diluted by 50%, but the value of the company only goes up by 20%. Then what's the point, right? There's some other calculations too, though, because you might be like, okay, I could probably make more money if we like, ups, you know, were even more diligent and even more hardworking and worked, you know, 18 hours a day, seven days a week. But for us, there was a point where we said, Financial stress absolutely sucks. It's one of the, I think for everyone, it's one of the most upsetting kind, you know, things to experience. Um, and having money, even if you wouldn't be financially stressed without it, allows you to put things in place in a business that sort of make your life easier and feel better and allow you to focus on kind of the, your core competencies. So that's always part of the calculation for us too. It's not just how do we maximize our wealth in the future? It's how do we balance this, you know, and, and make it. And so, so sometimes you might raise money and say, okay, we're going to give up a little more than the value is going to increase by, but it's going to make our jobs better. And we're going to be more productive and able to focus on what we like. Yeah. The narrative of uh, working seven days a week, 18 hours a day uh, there's no glory in that. I think there used to be, especially in the food and beverage industry, sort of like uh, posturing and bragging about how little amount of time you take away from your business. I'm not sure if it's directly related to the pandemic, but I think more and more people are trying to come to terms with the fact or at least be, be open about the fact that they either have other hobbies and things that they want to accomplish with their life besides their business, or they just want a little bit of a break. You know, you want a breather yeah. from making ice cream for the last 15 years and maybe have a day off. Exactly. I mean, for, for me, it's been, but part of it has been age too. When I was in my twenties and even early thirties, like I found it exhilarating. I mean, whether I was working for myself or, you know, working as a server in restaurants before that, like I found it exhilarating to work as lot, a lot. Like I do, I do a like brunch dinner shift at a restaurant I was working at in Brooklyn. And I'd be like ready to go out partying afterwards. I'm like, Jesus, I don't even think I could do the double shift now. I don't go out after. So yeah, as I've sort of gotten older, I, I think it's the, the physicalness of getting older, but also that, that, I guess coming to terms with the fact that this American ideal of like killing yourself working maybe isn't that cool, you know? Um, I mean, working's great. I'd be miserable if I didn't work, but when I work seven days a week now for like all day, like I feel really unhappy. Like I don't care that it's my own business and I love it. And we're going to hopefully make a lot of money in the future off it. Like it, it's a crummy feeling. Totally. Yeah. The, um, with taking that money and with the expansion of the factory comes the expectations that you're going to have X percentage growth, right? So you start having conversations that are uh, about models of scale and what's your scalability, right? That's the tech term that everyone is so obsessed with these mm -hmm. days. Um, if if it did, I'm curious, how did the relationship change between the three founders and your new equity partners in terms of maybe pressure to 
did you bring on a new CFO? Did you, was there talk of having a new CEO? Did they want a corporate board structure that would push you and uh, your two partners in a new Mm -hmm. sort of perhaps quote unquote, more professional direction? Like, Mm -hmm. obviously you're in a pretty unique position where you're, you're pretty big and you're definitely getting bigger, but by American standards, you're still kind of a small company, right? Tiny. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. um, So, is there talk either internally or, or externally from, from them of, all right, let's get to 100 locations. Like, how are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? Or has it been a much more uh, collaborative, uh, slower discussion about that? Sure. So, and, and I don't know if we've been lucky because I, this is my only experience with having um, you know investors who are putting sizable amounts of money into the company who are involved on the board. But we've always been aligned with our investors and board in terms of what to do. So, for example, when our first round of um, financing was $3 million and it was three and a half, about three and a half years, or yeah, three and a half years ago, we closed it. And leading up to that, one of the reasons we wanted to do it is we were, we recognized what we were good at and what we weren't that good at. Um, And we had never, none of us have ever, had ever worked at a company bigger than our company was at that point. So we said, instead of just figuring this out as we go, what if we hired someone who had already done this and like had already had all these aha moments and knew all of these tricks? So we wanted a COO. So part of that fundraising process was we want to get this money. We're going to do X, Y, and Z with this money. It's open some new stores. It's hire a pro at wholesale. It's hire a COO. Um, so that we, we were super aligned there. And then the, the way it works in terms of structure is when people put money in, um, they want board seats. Um, if you, if the founders don't have the majority of board seats, the founders lose control. There's other mechanisms you could build on certain decisions where like you might not have majority, but you'd have veto rights. Um, but you know, for us, it's, I think for any founder, it's super important to, maintain control, right? It's it's awesome. It's your business. You built it. At the same time, if you're growing so rapidly and you need so much money, you probably will lose control. Um, we have not yet. But I mean, it makes sense because if, I mean, if someone's putting $50 million into a company, um, they're going to want control. You know, they're going to want rights to protect that investment. Um so the way it works now is there's a board. And then in terms of like how that works with deciding on how much to grow, you know, it's, it's, we've never had an experience where someone's like, we're going to put this money in and we want you to do this. It's more like, this is our plan and that's what we need the money for. And if they like the plan, they invest and then they invest and nothing ever goes exactly as planned, right? The market changes, the pandemic happens. So then you have the board meetings. You also talk in between those and you say, this is what we're thinking. And sometimes there's some tension there, but I think that's good sometimes. I mean, I'll give an example. Um, About three years ago, we were having a board meeting and we wanted to open a store in the meatpacking district. And it was like $18,000 a month. It was on the, it was across from the Apple store. Um, And $18,000 a month, New York's expensive, but for an ice cream shop, that's really expensive. You know, we only have good business from like May to September. Outside of that, you know, sales are still pretty good, but like that's when we make the big money. Um, and our board, they didn't, they didn't have the right to veto it, but they really pushed on us. And we're like, you know what? You're right. And I'm so glad we didn't open that store. Um, so I think with anything, it's, it's important to and I get more humble as I get older. Like when we were young, we were, we were kind of arrogant in a lot of ways. We thought like, we're the best at ice cream making. We know exactly how to run a business. And as I get older, I'm like, I actually know less and less. I'm less sure of more things in a, in a, in a productive way, I think. Um, so yeah, just, I mean, we listen to the board and everyone's always aligned. I mean, the goal is to make money, right? That's why you start a business. Spend less than you make grow it. But when you're putting money into the business, if it's a lot, the, the plan is always to grow. So in that really excites us. Um, 
nobody's ever pushed us to grow more than we want to because you build cash flow models and budgets and you can only grow as much as you can financially support. Um, so I think if anything, when I was younger, I was, I would always push it. So like if, you know, my plan, which was based on very unsophisticated financial modeling would be like, you know, growth that if everything went as planned, we'd end up with, you know, three weeks of payroll in the bank, you know, and like those plans are not good. Um, Cause if something goes wrong, then you're in a tight space and I'll, I'll give some advice to, you know, anyone listening who's um, starting a business or already in business and raising money. Um, never, never raise money when you absolutely need it. Always raise money when, if you take it, great, you can grow even more. And if you don't take it, you know, you can move on to the next thing. But, we, you know, I, I we have made the mistakes before of saying we're going to raise money and let's start doing these capital projects, spending money before we've raised the money, but we'll definitely get it. Because that puts you in a position where you have to close the deal. And that's a really shitty position to be in. We're going to take a quick break for some commercial messages. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Eli, and I want to tell you about Magic Mind, a little magic elixir that makes you focus better on your work, be more creative, and drink less coffee. It's the world's first productivity drink. Magic Mind is a mix of 12 functional ingredients that makes you focus and that can help you fight off stress. It's created to be taken daily for a sharper mind, steady energy, and immune support. And this drink is for people like you, creators, entrepreneurs, cooks, freelancers, artists, and hospitality professionals. Athletes have Gatorade, and now you've got Magic Mind. So try starting your day off with Magic Mind in place of your morning coffee. You could sip it, chug it like a shot, or even turn it into a delicious matcha latte with your milk of choice. I've got a special offer for you, the listeners of Heritage Radio Network, from the folks over at Magic Mind. All you have to do is go to www.magicmind.co forward slash HRN, and you can use the discount code HRN at checkout to get 20% off your first order. Welcome back to The Line on Heritage Radio Network. We're going to jump back into the conversation with Ben Van Leeuwen, the founder of Van Leeuwen Ice Cream, right now. The scoop shops are are really fascinating to me um, for, for personal reasons because I'm in the fast casual business and I don't have alcohol sales. While it's not you know, apples to apples, I am really interested in other businesses where you have to turn and burn people through the door because the check average or whatever you might call it in a scoop shop is yeah, going to be comparably thing. lower than a traditional restaurant, right? So somebody comes in and, you know, they get two scoops of ice cream and yes, they leave pretty quickly and you can serve another customer, but also they might be out the door for less than 10 bucks. So when you're evaluating the cost of building a scoop shop, the labor that it takes to to uh, to run it, and then also all that refrigeration equipment, I'm wondering how. And also, it's seasonal, right? Like, especially in New York, we're not talking about the South here, or California, or yeah. even you know Utah. Like, it's just cold, cold, cold here for for several months out of the year. But you have a lot of shops here, so I'm wondering why open the scoop shops. Uh, how do you keep them moving in the off season? And also, what is the what's the true reason for the scoop shops? Is it profit? Is it marketing? Is it a mixture? If you could talk a little bit about all that, sure. So, the impetus for opening scoop shops originally was we loved it. You know, I worked in food service since I was fourteen. You know, starting at a snack bar at the beach. And I love being on my feet. I love serving people. I love talking to people. Like, I mean, it's still, when I work in the scoop shops, those are still like far and away my best days at work. I just feel so happy, so gratified after. Um, I love it. So so we we love that business, like so, so deeply. So there was no, I mean, even when we started, there, there was financial planning. We said, this is what we think it'll make. This is what it will cost. But how do we... I, I think your your question around check average was, or your your comment on that was 
absolutely true for us in the same way it is for you guys with no with no alcohol right we're not only are we losing a ton of revenue but we're losing the highest margin product that most restaurants are, are going off of um ours is so, so the benefits because we have a we have a low check average i think it's eight or nine bucks um the benefits though are operational simplicity so everything is manufactured centrally at the factory um it's super condensed so a three gallon ice cream tub has 50 scoops which in new york city now trade for 625 each um so it's an incredibly efficient little operation um so we don't need a ton of labor and in the ice cream scoop shop we can really flex labor in a way where a restaurant can't or full service so whether a full service is doing 10 covers a night or well, maybe if they were doing 10, they wouldn't need. But if they're doing 50 covers versus 150, they need a host, they need a dishwasher, they need an expediter, they need the prep cooks, um, they need the busser. Whereas like when it's really quiet in the winter, for a lot of our hours, not on the weekends, we'll just have one scooper. Um, so we can really flex the labor there. So that helps a lot. But labor is so, so, so important. So we have a hyper focus on labor because we are like many other businesses who are similar to ours. Like the dream is a 10% profit margin, right? Um, you know, that would be absolutely awesome. So if you're like five points above where you want to be on labor as a percentage of revenue, like you're totally screwed. Like even one point sucks, right? This isn't tech where we have like 50 to 80% margins and we we have sort of the the freedom to not be good at labor control, right? Um, in our businesses, we have to like scrutinize it and look at it. But at the same time, we also have to pay people in a way where it's a compelling job and they feel good about what they're making. Um, so so con controlling the labor is really important. But Eli, I, you, you had asked me a couple other things that I missed in there, which I, I wanted to answer. No, I think you covered, I really do think you covered it. I just am I'm also wondering, like, you know, is there something about the scoop shop that is beyond just profit? Are they also marketing? Like, is it, is it, um, do you make a conscious decision to open a scoop shop in specific neighborhoods? I know you turned down meatpacking, but, you know, you have multiple locations around New York. Are they strategic? from a profitability standpoint, or are you also trying to accomplish, you know, market share based on eyeballs? Yeah. So both. So marketing and profitability. So if you look at the scoop shop channel compared to the CPG channel, which is the 14 ounce cups that get sold in grocery stores, the scoop shops are far more profitable. So their contribution margin is much higher, like triple or quadruple. Um, the, so, so they're profitable marketing wise, they really support the CPG channel. So one way to think of it is like, if we open a scoop shop, particularly in a new market, like Houston, where we just started opening shops last May, and we're actually about to open another one next week. We're super excited. Um, that's giving people incredibly immersive experiences surrounded by the brand right they're trying the product they're paying to try the product they're being served by a real human who's talking about the product versus pay like 15 bucks a person to try to reach them on instagram um so for marketing we think scoop shops all the way um basically it's a money-making billboard right again even if we didn't have the grocery channel to support we'd still do it because a we really enjoy it b they're profitable but we've seen um th this is a good anecdote so when we started in new york city we had one ice cream truck then we built another and we got up to six trucks in new york city now we just have two but this is what we thought we thought as we expand the business in new york we'll be able to make more revenue but every location is going to make a little less because the product's going to be less special. It won't be as like, I have to find this one truck. And then we started opening stores and we sort of thought the same thing would happen. But the opposite happened. And I actually think this is really unfair because I'm a consumer 
who wants to find like the one-off shop, you know, who wants to find like the artisanal, you know, bakery that's been there for 80 years and, you know, the grandpa's still making everything. Um, But I think because of that connection to tribalism, that's like still um, that we've evolved, that we haven't evolved out of having yet, there's incredible trust in brands that are familiar so as we as we've expanded from one truck to 18 scoop shops in New York City and in virtually every supermarket in New York City the revenue keeps going up um now at the same time we've constantly improved our product are offering tons of new products so th- there's that too but i think part of it is that familiarity but now looking at that i'm i think of course that's what's going to happen but when we are smaller cuz we were thinking too much we weren't thinking about what the market thinks like. We were thinking about what us, these three sort of food obsessed people who will like read about a chocolate farm for an hour and like how they ferment the chocolate thinks about. And and, and that's another marketing point, which we should talk about in a second, because that's an interesting one. Um, so, so we've seen not only the stores supporting the CPG channel, but the stores supporting each other. So as they as we have more and more, each one's revenue and the number of people we serve increases. Yeah, you know, even from my perspective of interacting with your product as someone who is lactose intolerant, so I'm always looking for a good vegan ice cream. Right, the first time I tried your product was actually um, in pint form, and then what's been like you've said the tribalism and just sort of. Uh, understanding the product and coming in sort of actually probably from your perspective via the back door and not the front door is that now if I'm out and about and I'm craving vegan ice cream, you're a sure thing. So that is the way that I also have approached you know, my business to a certain extent is like a billboard. Like we're both actually have a location in Rockefeller Center and I really do look at it as like a marketing expense, you know, like I'm there to get people's eyeballs on the space so that hopefully one day if I can open up on the Lower East Side and the Upper West Side and blah, 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 expansion, expansion, they say, haven't I seen that before? Haven't I tasted that before? So I'm looking at it almost as like a sample shop. I'm like, if I can get them in the door and I can get them to taste it, maybe they will remember that there will be brand recognition for down the line. So um, that's really cool to hear that as you've expanded your locations, they've actually had a positive relationship uh, yeah. with each other. That's really fascinating. Um, the the COVID thing, which has shaped our lives for the last uh, almost now I guess we're at the two year mark, basically. Uh, I want to ask about supply chain. We touched on it very briefly, which is uh, product, you know, raw product is the costs of that have gone up dramatically. But also you put your product either into a sort of a paper combustible container, or it gets scooped into a paper cup at the at the scoop shops, uh, has it impacted your business dramatically? Have you been able to buy so much in bulk that that hasn't been a problem? So first off on the raw product um, side and then on the paper goods side, since basically you only make products to go, (laughs) um, how has that impacted your business? Um, It has impacted the business in every single way. Um, And... I mean, it has driven our cost to make ice cream way up. So an example is our cup supplier had to increase pricing by 15% for the cups that we sell in grocery stores. If you go into most of our scoop shops right now in any market, you're going to start seeing that the cups that we serve in are no longer branded. Um, So there was, I, I, I don't exactly know downstream on the supply chain what affected that but we're not seeing printed cups anymore. We want to get back to them, of course. Um, Raw materials, um, we were looking at a spreadsheet the other day. Dairy has skyrocketed. Um, 
and we use a lot of cream, we're an 18% butterfat ice cream, we'll never change that as long as I'm in charge. Um, so there's never, a, an option is never to reformulate. Um, haagen in the last 10 years has gone from a 17% butterfat to a 14. Um, and again, I'm not knocking them, like their product is much lower priced than us, like they couldn't stay there. Um, so what do we do? Um, the first move we made was increasing prices in the scoop shops, you know, by 20 cents a scoop. And that helps, right? But we're also, but, you know, the the demand for labor versus supply is also tenuous. So we also increase wages. So we increase prices, we increase wages, ingredient costs go up. Now I'm just like describing inflation, right? Um but the the other really big one for us, um, which I think a lot of people don't think about, is what we what in our P and L is called fulfillment. So the cost to move stuff around. So I'll give you one anecdote. Where I am in Utah right now, where we're making ice cream bars, um, it used to cost us forty five hundred dollars to send a truckload of bars from Utah to the storage facility in New Jersey where we store them. It's over eight thousand now. Um, so yeah, fulfillment. That's a huge extra cost way. to eat every single time. It, it, it's a huge extra cost and, and you can only raise prices so far. It's especially difficult to raise prices in wholesale in a nimble way because you need to give your um, distributors a 90 day heads up. So if these, co- if you get hit with these costs, you'll have to absorb them for the first 90 days. But the other tricky part is we're already a pretty highly high priced product on the shelf in grocery stores. There's other ice creams that are more expensive, but we, we our strategy was to take a lower margin and our goal was to trade like a dollar or two more than Hagen Doss and Ben and Jerry's. So more expensive because we can't make the product at the same price in the way that we're making it, but something that's sort of palatable. Um, so like depending on the market, you'll actually see our product between five and in New York, some places charge like 10 bucks, but generally you'll see it like five to eight dollars a pint on the shelves in um in whole in grocery stores. Um and so as you see that continuing, I mean inflation is here and we've got uh issues up and down the supply chain. Is there is there a point where you see yourself in the next year raising it again or do you say to yourself we're really hitting our ceiling and we just are going to have to suffer potential losses or very tiny margins uh because there is you know there is a level of palatability that people will accept for yeah. a product right like no one is going to pay $22 for a pint of ice cream you know they're not right. going to they're not going to pay you know $9 probably for for a scoop probably not so um as the person in charge of the business like how do you reconcile all of that while you're 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 on an upward trajectory but then you like got chopped off at your knees which is the scoop shops really have probably suffered for for a while and uh and it's winter time right so it's a difficult time for you as an ice cream maker it's super hard so what what do we do um everything we can quickly in terms which right now is a small wholesale price increase. Um, we did a, a retail price increase of 20 cents a scoop in January. Um, and I mean, the other thing you can do is reformulate, but we're not reformulating. Um, we're not going to change the product. That the, the the risk there, I think, is just too high. And, and I don't want to do it. I, I make a product that I think is awesome, and it's, it's made in the way that I intend to make it. Um, but in terms of it, if is it going to keep going? I mean, I'm not a like brilliant economist, but if it does keep going, then do we just have a, a new economy where minimum wage is twenty two dollars and a scoop of ice cream is eight dollars and a pint is you know seven to ten instead of four to eight or five to eight for Van Leeuwen? Um, maybe, but but that that part I don't. I mean, there's so much complexity there. Um, but certainly it seems like that's that's the rate we're going at. Um, I just don't know, and I was talking about this last night, I don't know if the 
working class wages are going up enough in a way where they're not going to get really, really badly impacted by the cost of dairy going up 50% two weeks ago and then another 50%, you know, a week after that. Um, it's pretty scary. Um, but I mean, we have, we have good economists running this economy. So hopefully they'll do things that make this all work. <laughs> yeah. Sort of above, way above our pay grade of trying yeah. to figure out how to sell, uh, sell food to people on a daily basis. Yeah, but, but, but absolutely fascinating. And yeah, I mean, in short, you, you raise prices, um, and, and, or you reformulate or, you know, get, you know, change your portion size. Um, but the price raising is all we're looking at right now. So you heard it here first, Van Leeuwen will never reformulate. That is a key to their success. Of course, I do want to ask about the future. You're coming up on 20 years and people that have been doing a singular business for a lot long, a lot shorter than you have definitely looked around and thought about other things and thought about their exit strategy. And you're at the 20 year mark. So I'm wondering, are you thinking at all, um, you know, just like poking your nose into maybe other F and B businesses that, that might uh, be interesting to you, or are you like singularly focused on Van yeah. Leeuwen? And are you, are you thinking to yourself, like, this is the next I can do 20 more years of this. I can do 40 more years mm. of this. Like, where is your head at on that? Um, so right now I'm like singularly focused in terms of business just on the ice cream company. Um, because as we both know, the food business is so hard, you know, and it's so hard to execute your vision and do that consistently. And our vision is to make good ice cream and serve it to people in a really friendly environment. Super easy to say, right? But to scale that up is hard. So we're planning a lot of growth over the next couple of years. So I have to just be focused on that. Um, there definitely is a part of me that thinks, can I make a lot of money off this? I hope to make a lot of money off this. We've grown it, you know, to a sizable company, still small by American standards. Um, but I don't like to strategize too much on that. Um, just because I have, the, I have this belief that like, if we can serve really good ice cream, in a friendly environment and keep doing it over and over again, we'll be able, we'll have a lot of good sort of potential financial incomes for ourselves rather than sort of reverse engineering and saying, we want to make this amount of money each. This is what we have to do. Now, a lot of people do it that way and they make a lot of money, but I just think as, as cliche as this sounds, if you just obsess over the customer and then of course, obsess over the profitability of the business, because if you're spending more than a dollar of every revenue that comes in, it's not going to work. Um, I, I think you'll you'll do well, right? But but that's the you know people have said to me over the years like the hardest problem to solve is sales, right? If you have an expense problem, your labor's a little high, your supply chain's messed up, and you should be buying chocolate and having it shipped in a different way, you can fix that. But if you don't have customers and you're not giving people something that makes them like super happy and want to come back like that you can't fix. So, so to sort of conclude, I'm just hyper focused on that. And honestly, I'm, I, we have a lot of fear. I, I mean, call it humility, but my partners and I, I mean, we're incredibly grateful that people enjoy Van Leeuwen and they come and try it. We're just, we're so happy that to, to see when people come to the stores and get the ice cream. So we, we never for a second take it for granted. So nor do we rest on the standard that we're at right now. We're constantly saying, how can we make this store more comfortable? How can we make our teams happier, which means happier customers? Um, and how can we make products that excite people even more and make them want to come back and keep buying them? Ben, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Yeah, Eli, thank you. The line is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Instagram and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. 
You can also find us at facebook.com slash Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners just like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Subscribe to the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join the HRN family by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Hey, listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign, and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate... You can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you.